sake of all our futures, mortgages and pensions, we are uh, right to feel that we are just at the, the start of an ever-growing and ever-expanding trend. But um, I think there is a certain substance behind that because if you look at the offerings coming out of Baal, um, actually I would say coming out of Switzerland, but coming out of Japan as well, we seem to be in the heritage business. Let's face it, mechanical watches became obsolete in 69 when quartz was perfected, and yet they never seem to decline in popularity. The digital watch didn't kill them, the smart watch certainly won't kill them, and yet their heyday seems to be firmly rooted in that sort of 50s, 60s, 70s era, and that is the, the refrain that keeps coming back from Switzerland and from Japan is that this is the era they want to refer to. And of course, we have in our auctions and collections the originals that these reissues are based on. So I think as more people come into it, the knowledge grows. And um, whether it be the, the value proposition or the rarity proposition, there's, there's offer at, at, all, at all levels. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a growing market, a growing interest. And I think the, I think the, the, the internet um, the, the, the availability of information is, is only feeding that dragon. I think we're, we're really, really seeing something that is, that is growing and it's a very big world out there. There are a lot of people uh, and there's a lot of people with, with interest and the, the, the collecting of wristwatches um, has been going on for a long time. Uh, and the people who are passionate about it, you know, 20, 25 years ago, are still passionate about it now. Uh, and those, th their, their knowledge is just being passed on and, and, and perpetuated. Uh, and I think we're all enjoying the fact that we're, you know, we're able to talk to more people about, you know, you say, you say that you're, you're, you're selling watches and 20 years ago people went, oh, really? Okay, fine. Move use, on. Use <laughs> car salesman. <laughs> and now, and now they, 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 there's an interest, there's a spark. There's a, oh, well, that's interesting. And then you start to talk about it in in depth and it really it really catches catches the imagination so no i think we're in i think we're in a good place i think we're at, at the beginning of something not at the beginning but i think we're at, at, at the, the growing point of something that will continue mm. i um i definitely agree i definitely agree in fact i agree um with all the fundamentals that you've you've identified i think seeing the reissues uh and the, the sort of the the harking back to heritage inspiration for the for the, the pieces that were released by the big brands like Longines and, and Omega at uh, Bal and Patek to a fair extent as well um, only bodes well for the vintage market. Um, I also think that uh, we're seeing a, a huge growing mushrooming um, sort of enthusiasm and uh, number numbers of people getting into vintage watches, particularly young people, you know, below the, I would say in the sort of 25 to 35 age bracket who uh, previously would have played it safe and bought a Rolex with their first bonus, now are, are brave enough thanks to all sorts of different platforms to make an informed choice and go and, go and spend something on a watch that's 50 or 60 years old, which I admire enormously. And to be fair, slightly count myself amongst because that's certainly how I felt about the vintage market when I came into it. Um, you add all that to uh, a bunch of other things and a huge amount of maturity, and, and I think the longevity is there. I, I think we're, uh, yeah, I certainly think we're on the ascent, and on, on, not at the top, not at the descent. How long it will last? The only thing I will say is that there's always a cyclicality to, to all markets. Um, but I don't think, I, I think what, what's, what's really collectible today, what's getting more and more collectible today, isn't going to disappear. That's going to continue to be collectible, just like Rolexes have been for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, so too will, will a number of other brands. I have to be the broken record, unfortunately, um, both from, from obvious personal bias, personal bias, but equally because I just believe it. For now, at least, the, the, the brand that's, um, that's on everyone's lips is Hoyer. It remains Hoyer. Six months later, a year later, vintage Hoyer is just it, and particularly the Otavias. But again, I'm certainly biased. What's hot at the moment? I think something um, a little more historic for me, and that would be the, um, 
uh, the Type 20s, uh, the Type 20s that have been made across various brands, so Brightling, Breguet, uh, all sorts of uh, brands have, have done them. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting collecting area, so I think that's somewhere that will be hot in the future. Yeah, I, I would totally agree, and I think you can broaden it out into a category, and I think at the moment it is the steel chronograph. Um, I think in terms of surprises, there's an awful lot of minor brands or uh, brands who are essentially the movement makers, own name on the dial, who are suddenly starting to make multiples of what they would sort of two, three, four years ago. And um, especially with the authenticity of people like Le Mania on the dial, who's Le Mania under the bonnet as well, I think there's an enormous amount of growth possibility simply because everyone at the top end is using Valjoux's, not their own brand. Yes, it's nice that it's a Rolex, but the, the growth of the, of the maker brands, I think, is, uh, is one to watch. Well, I, I think this is an interesting one because I, I come across a lot of older collectors who were maybe collecting 10, 15, 20 years ago, and especially dress watches. They have spent a lot of money often having them professionally restored to essentially mint condition. And then they come in and see us and we look at them and say, oh, well, this is refinished, restored in a way that says that's not a good thing and they feel very upset because they feel that they've done right by this historic watch in in taking it back to as new condition and I think this is a, an interesting dichotomy firstly between dress and sport slash tool watches because I think there's almost a tradition that it's somehow okay to refinish a dress watch because it should look like it's barely worn and tool watches need to bear the scars of their everyday work but what's interesting is we still want minty tool watches but not too mint because we want the loom to have aged and I just think this is a, a an area where the the collecting hobby if you like is conflicted we don't know whether we want something to be mint or worn if it's worn it's got to be done something exciting like a military watch is restoring something that's just about to fall apart okay? If the loom plots have gone, do you wear it with the loom plots gone? Or do you get somebody to do a, a good job? And will it ever come back round? It's fascinating. I mean, it's a fascinating area. Um, I think I think we've got we've got so many so many levels of this. Um, you've got. I mean, I, I, mean, I think we're all agreed something that is in absolutely brand new condition and is vintage is, is, is the top and it's very, very interesting. But where, as you say, where do you draw the line? I mean, you've got something that's got a completely trash dial, um, yet it's a very interesting and fantastic watch. Do you just discard it and say, well, that's it, it's finished, it's, it's dead, it's done? Or do you get it restored and, and, and what, 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 effect should that have on, on the value and I think the <clears throat> the idea of, uh, of, of, of the parallel um, of, of the cars having making cars from from barn finds to to completely restored fantastic better than new condition um, is not something that is reflected in the watch world at all as soon as you touch something and it, maybe it has a reflection on the fact that that there is this need for things to be correct. So maybe people correct things that, and do it in, in, in a less than straightforward way. So they try and hide it. And, and that's, I think that's, that's, I think that's the, the hurdle that there is at the moment. You've got, really got this, 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 this problem of the need for things to be correct and to be right. And there should, there should be a, a, a full disclosure um, ab ability to be able to say, well, you know, it's been restored, but isn't it fantastic anyway? Um, that's my that's my point of view. I certainly agree with both of you, uh, gentlemen. I think um, it is interesting to think that 10, 15 years ago, there was almost a sort of assumption or compulsive obsession around the idea of restoring a watch to its uh, its earlier glory. 
Um, and we see that all the time, you know, watches popping up and being offered and, and you have to, you know, kindly and gently uh, and unoffensively tell the gentleman or, or lady who wants to sell the watch that unfortunately it's not worth what it, what it could have been if they'd not restored it. That is a fashion of its time that has shifted in the last 10, 15 years. My view for the better, uh, you will always get extreme cases where things are perhaps, you know, you see extreme um, attempts to uh, falsify originality, so restorations that go to the nth degree, which obviously overcomplicate markets, particularly vintage Rolex, I, I think it's fair to say, but increasingly others. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, a lot of the watch restorers and, and the best servicing agents for, for vintage watches themselves haven't quite necessarily caught up with times. In their mind, a beautifully restored vintage watch is still of greater value than an original watch. And having that conversation with them in the first instance, I found one of the most revealing because you could see that it had really sort of impregnated it in their thinking and, uh, and they had then ridden that wave. And now you're having to say, well, stop. Don't touch that watch before you buy it or before you speak to anyone about it. Let me see it and, and, and let's leave it where it is, perhaps. On the other hand, I have a perfect example in mind where I recently got a, bought a watch a year ago, actually, and I had to send it back to the brand and go through that horrible sort of gut-wrenching decision of having a full restoration um, because it had been badly restored in the past. So there had been... Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a... Jazzo de Coute Geophysique Lux, one of the 10, I think, rose gold pieces that were ever made. And no one knew about it. And it was, I bought it at auction, mislabeled in Germany and no translations and this, that and the other. And I was delighted. But when it arrived on closer inspection, I saw that there was something not quite right with the print. And so even though it was subtle, I knew that anyone worth their sort would, would spot the mistake. And naturally, the right thing to do was to, 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 to get it completely corrected because it would be impossible to find a, an original dial and get it serviced by the brand at, at considerable expense and time because at least then you can say well it's been done the way it should be even if it's restored um, so yeah i think there are exceptions to the rule but the general trend is certainly better to leave unrestored well we've got this kind of stratification haven't we because mm -hmm. as you said the uh the ultimate is the new old stock box and papers fell down the back of the safe 40 years ago. And be because of its rarity, these are personal objects, they get worn, they get worn out, they get serviced. And so something that hasn't, its rarity speaks for itself. But then th the next stage down is, we would say, is probably a worn original example. But there's an awful lot of watches that seem to be getting almost left behind because either they're a very heavily worn mm. to the point of worn out or they are worn and then restored. And with the polarization of prices, certainly in the auction market, we're finding that there's a lot of nice watches that seem to be getting left mm. to the side. So it will be interesting to see if these do get picked up and whether the, the issue of transparency that you raised is an interesting one. I mean, obviously, if people are trying to hide that this is a restoration, that's something we don't want because we want the market to reflect honesty. Yeah. It is what it is. But if we, say, look to the, the vintage car market where you have biofines versus concourse, and you have restorers of high quality who can say, I can take this back to exactly the quality. This won't be some horrible, wonky printing, over lacquered, dial this will be as good as the day it left that brand even if those skills are lost to the brand themselves mm -hmm. then I think there's an argument for saying you know especially on a dress watch which it's kind of mm. doing it justice that you could advertise it as almost restored by and if there was a a recognized restorer of high quality that might start to add some sort of cachet to the piece. I guess um, transparency is everything. Yeah. Because uh, there are there are vintage watch businesses that I think uh, make pretty much 100% of, of their sales on the basis of restoring vintage watches to sort of their, their former glory and, um, and, it, and it seems to work well for them because there are clients who, who want it. So I think if honesty and transparency in, in what you're selling is, is the only caveat. To, to well we have the, the, the um, shall we say the customization of modern pieces mm -hmm. so you know the next step logically seems to be if you have a, a a very tired and not attractively aged vintage piece mm -hmm. then maybe that's ripe for 
sensitive and high quality work which is actually advertised and paraded rather than hidden and, and, and lied about. It all comes, to me, it comes down to disclosure. Yeah. I mean, I, I love a Seiko, as anybody who knows me well knows. And Seiko fans are notorious for modding their watches because they're cheap, they're easy to work on. If you break it, you go and buy another one and you start again. You can change bezels, you can change dials, handsets, um, change the cases, swap them around, make something you love, and then show it off and go, I built that. Isn't it great? Mm -hmm. Or not, um, <laughs> depending on your level of taste. Um, but having said that, the collectors of the vintage get very, very concerned about aftermarket dials and bezels, just like any other brand collector. But I think as long as you are disclosing and saying, this is something I built myself, this is, um, and on the other side saying, no, this is vintage, but has these parts changed make of it what you will and the price you want to pay. I think that's where you have to, to draw the line. I think, it, I think it, it does. It comes down to that, that pretending it's not what it is, is the, is, is the problem. So making something, making something from parts to look like something that it wasn't to begin with. So I think you're, you're, you're totally right. It's completely, it's completely about transparency and honesty. And, that, and that's, that's what will affect the market and will we'll have have the effect on the market get any of any of them I mean the, 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 there's there's an old example of this and that would be the um, the striped Rolex prints we all, we all remember um, and 15 years ago 20 years ago they were they were incredibly popular and very very saleable uh, and the price was going up and up and up and then you got people swapping movements around and putting different cases in and then making up cases to put to put them in and really making fake watches and that and that's 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 when the market went okay well, we're not touching any then if we're not sure about some then where where do we where do we know so they the the market disappeared to a certain extent and i think that's where the franken franken frankenstein watches is a is a big problem what I, I mean, I, I agree. What I, what I like about the way times are changing, um, if I'm honest, is that, you know, if you look back 10 years to sort of the, the, the beginnings of uh, the sort of the collectors online forums and other sort of mediums through which collectors would exchange notes and check and, and, and serial numbers and this and the other, the way that has escalated and developed, sometimes, sometimes not necessarily for good, but in the majority, definitely yes. It's allowed so much greater uh, sort of fact-checking and oversight and forced the hands of so many people who used to perhaps hide in the shadows and, and rely upon the obscurity of what they're doing and the need for in-depth knowledge and um, the absence of evidence, photography or otherwise, for them to double-check things. That has now changed, and so you almost have you know, in a, in, a, in a generally benevolent way, a, a sort of uh, a, an authenticity police online at all times who can check photos, yes. who can look and, you know, and, 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 and in most cases, I think when mistakes are made, they're probably innocent because actually, you know, there isn't really, um, it isn't easy to necessarily recognize when something has, has been changed in a movement that's as subtle as a, as, a, as a small part or a piece. It's much more obvious when it's on the dial side because that's where all the attention gets focused on. Um, but the way the market has changed means that I think now, not only will there be greater expectation of transparency, there will be an obligation, a sense of there not being any choice but to provide additional photos and, and additional levels of, of uh, disclosure to avoid the potential catastrophic sort of criticism of a, a big chunk of the community online. Because that stays forever and a day, that particular criticism is there on a page in, in, on the internet. So I, I think we're, we're shifting um, in a healthy way. I think it's just gonna require a lot of careful, careful management. If, if we take it to the top level, is it, would you consider it permissible to what I, what I call building the perfect beast? So, for example, if you have 
a couple of mill subs, neither of them have been through auction. They are not known in the collector's market. One is trashed, but has a good movement. They're from the same batch, so the parts are largely interchangeable. Can you put a good bezel on a good dial and a good case to create something that would be possibly multiples of value more than the two individual parts? Given the fact they're contemporary parts, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell. No, well, but is that, is that allowable? Or are we saying, no, 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 you can't do that because it, everything has to stay in an or ideal world? Or would you then insist on disclosure? It, disclosure. I, I, I would go down the disclosure yeah. route, absolutely. I, I, I think, it, I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a shame to, 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 do, to do anything else, um, to have two pieces and melange them into one to, to make a fantastic thing. Is, it, it's ultimately slightly... Dishonest is the wrong word, but it, it's not. It's not really where where we should be going. I don't think. I don't think. Um. It, it, I guess for me, and and, and I sort of I, I agree. Um, but I guess for me to to sort of very slightly shave off that, um, it just depends on how you do it, uh, which is an easy answer. But I have one particular example in mind. Um, I won't. I won't be too specific. But there are um, there are Hoyer or Tavias that uh, were dials that were made as prototypes for a new model that never, never, never actually were cased up. Completely different from any other Ortavia. Um, completely documented and recognized in the Hoyer community. Um, and I believe one is soon coming up for auction, although I, I wouldn't want to be too confident about that. Um, and those dials, um, have been put in, 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 in the corresponding watch that they were designed for, the correct, you know, quote-unquote, bezel, case, movement, etc. hands. Um, everybody knows they exist, they're widely discussed, but they never actually hit the market. No one ever physically put that dial in that case. But there are only six or ten of them known to exist anywhere. Um, and so if you, in that extreme example, which is not what you're talking about specifically because you're saying, well, what about if you're making something better from the best of different examples and elements of the original that you took weren't as good as they could be. I sort of have mixed feelings about that. I think that in most cases it's fine as long as you do it, A, absolutely consistently, so you make sure that what you've done is completely and totally uh, correct as far as the, the, the watch is concerned, and B, as long as you're honest about it. Um, and, you, and I do think that that's, that's it. I mean, you, you leave the choice then up to the collector as to whether they want that or not. Um, but going back to that specific example I was talking about, there you have a situation where actually the community is wild about it. Because, and they don't have any trouble with the fact that this has basically been, the dial has been swapped out from a watch that, that uh, previously did exist and put with a dial that hypothetically uh, never sat in a watch because then it, it's, a, it's a sort of, what's the word, uh, a white swan, you know, it, as opposed to a black one. It's, a, you know, it's something unusual that people know exists, know that it's been created, but know that there's a story and a history to it. It's, all, it's also, it almost is coming back to our vintage custom, yeah. isn't it? It's yeah. a legitimate dial, yeah. but it was, it's an opportunity to wear a legitimate dial yeah. in a watch in a way that was never actually allowed to happen. And, and but, it, but it had the transparency, it has the transparency, everybody knows about it, so to my mind, yeah, absolutely. It has a great story. Yeah. That's, that's, I suppose, what a vintage watch should have, a fantastic story, whether it's how you bought it or who owned it before or what its what its purpose was in the military, those sort of things. I think the, one of the interesting things is how we we access time and the fact that to have a reliable, dependable, accurate watch is no longer an absolute need because we have a computer screen which tells us the time, a mobile phone that tells us the time, for goodness sake, we have a microwave <laughs> that might tell us the time. <laughs> so we are surrounded by the time, so we can wear that slightly delicate, maybe slightly temperamental vintage watch and not feel, oh my goodness, what if? Um, we, can, we, we don't have that ultimate dependence on it being absolutely right, that 
w was there in the past, and which is why when quartz came along, people went, ah, it's cheaper, it's more reliable, it's supremely accurate, this is the answer to my prayers. Yeah. Now we're actually talking about, you know, what just as a lifestyle choice mm -hmm. and a style indication. Mm -hmm. What kind of a person are you? Sport watch, dress watch, slim, mm. complicated. Mm. But actually needing them to tell the time rather than just look lovely on your wrist is very much a, a side issue. Yeah. They don't have to be safe queens if they're fragile. You can wear them and just... It's art on the wrist. Your yeah. Exactly. Art on the wrist. Mm -hmm. a, lot of my, a lot of my clients look at it that way uh, when they're choosing whether to invest in in, in, in art or in cars or whatever it may be, now they increasingly feel comfortable with the notion that they're investing in something that they can wear because they know they're careful and the kinds of people who will take care of what they have. They know that if they ever have a problem, they can pick up the phone and, 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 and you know, probably have that corrected in a, in a, in a healthy and smart way. Um, but I, yeah, I completely agree. We're seeing a shift, particularly with vintage, where people are seeing it as an objet d'art to enjoy as opposed to something that maybe 20 or 30 years ago didn't have that much patina and we're still in the realm of is it a timepiece is it is it going to replace um, whatever else i was using now it's a very very nice thing uh, you know i had people call me up asking whether they should buy the new speedmaster or the the box set of the seamaster the speedmaster the railmaster um, people who had only bought vintage, who collect vintage, because they, the aesthetics appealed to them and they liked the idea of having this beautiful complete box set with everything that matched. And um, I'll be honest, my advice was don't, especially not with the box set because it had Trilogy on the dial, which I thought was a terrible, terrible misfire. However, uh, I do think that the individual pieces, are, for example, from Omega are very nice, particularly the Speedmaster, where it's been very, very smartly put together and, and all the proportions and everything are right. Um, those sort of things, you know, if you, you're never going to, you know, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to be able to get a Speedmaster of that provenance and age and that condition on your wrist for less than 60 grand. But for, for four and a half thousand Swiss, or whatever it was, X tax, you could suddenly have that on your wrist and, and you could enjoy some of the pleasure that someone who does own the original probably enjoys. Um, and it's good for the vintage market, of course it is, because as we already touched upon, reissues uh, always spark interest amongst those who want the originals. Um, yeah. So my, my only concern, and it's a trend that's been certainly within Switzerland for, for 10 years or more, is that there's a lack of new ideas coming out of the big brands. It seems to be like those bands that get to a certain point in their career and all they ever do then is churn out re uh, recollected versions of their greatest hits. And you want to see somebody being bold and saying, no, we're going to produce a very contemporary, modern, new take on what a watch should look like. I, I think for a jeweler turned watchmaker, Bulgari are doing something very interesting in that way because it's, they're, they're promoting a watch which looks extremely modern. Technically, it's very good and it's not referring to anything. But what everybody else seems to be doing is saying, you know, what are the styles, the models that people are raving about? Let's bring them back again. And obviously, the anniversaries is, is a prime key to hang all of this on. Yeah. And so we can almost get our calendars out and plot Switzerland's production for the next 10 to 15 years by looking at yeah. when they launched and 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, yeah. um, we will know what we're to expect, which I think is a shame. Yeah. But having said that, I totally take your point, Silas, about it's an opportunity to wear a style, and we're back to seeing this as a, a, a style question, and possibly a reliability question, of something that use no way within your grasp within the vintage or auction market. Um, not sure what I feel about fake loom, though. <laughs> you know, that tanning mm, or awesome. even slightly orange yeah. version, you kind of think, well, it would have started white or mm. cream, and that artificial aging, I mm. think, is a little kitsch. Mm. Um, but I see why it's done. Mm.
because you know we're we're as much in the in the style and, and fashion business now mm. as the lifestyle as, business and, and the lifestyle mm. business. Yeah, I mean, um, I have to say, I just I just to go back to what you're saying. I I completely agree in the sense that I think the um, it's it, we're we're seeing something that's almost a little tragic. It's like a you know there's the, everything is planned a year or two years in advance in anticipation of the next bar, the next SIHH. The Swiss watch industry as a whole, as opposed to the other parts of the industry that have done well, or the specific markets like vintage and independent, we're seeing, you know, they're, they're having increasingly difficult times. And so in difficult years, uh, obviously, the easier thing to do than develop a new movement is to develop a new dial and, and change some colors around and add a different colored bezel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do think it's a sign of, um, insecurity possibly uh, unfortunately and um, and probably not a healthy sign for the for the, for the future that, that so many of these brands are harking back to previous successes to be able to have surefire sales successes but you know uh, it, it, I guess it won't last forever perhaps it is a fashion thing that for the next couple of years we're gonna see it especially with the big numbers coming up anniversary wise um, but it is interesting what you talked about when you mentioned Bulgari other um, quote-unquote sort of fashion brands that have entered the watch industry in the last few years actually like Fabergé are probably showing the most innovation yeah. which I admire wholeheartedly um, and you know the, they collaborate with independent brands and, and they understand that there's a there's a possible synchronicity there for movement design and, and so forth so yes vintage inspired definitely what a lot of people want easy way to reach something that you would otherwise not be able to afford and it's too infrequent to access um, too much of it, probably a bad thing. Well, when, you, when you're looking at sales, you're looking at what's popular. And if you're looking at, 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 at you, you're mentioning bands. I mean, you, you look at a busker in the street and they, they play something that everybody knows and they're the ones that get the money and the people who are playing their, their own stuff get, get nothing. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an easy way into the market. And I, I think it's, it's uh, I think so you're it's Essentially. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. Those of us who deal in the vintage watch market <laughs> yeah, are creating the problem. <laughs> but I, I think you, you also have the, 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 the need um, for, for something to be, to be the future vintage watches. Um, and, and maybe that is being, being bought on by the independent makers. And I think that might be, that might be somewhere that, that if you were collecting now might be and a very interesting place to be, to, be, to be looking. Especially because a lot of the big brands will not look to support your vintage pieces after sort of 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking at 30 or 40 years time, you'll still be starting from scratch whether you've bought a big brand piece or you know, launched out into to an independent piece. And I, I just think, not even to the, the high-end independents, but some of the smaller brands um, who are just very clear on their house style um, will possibly be the vintage collection pieces of the future because they have marched out on their own and said this is who we are, this is what we're about and we're not copying anything. And they're probably stylistically more relevant now so that that will transport itself in the future when you're looking back and going well you know why do I want to buy a 1950s piece that was made in 2017? Why don't yes. I buy a 2017 piece? Mm. 